important leadership, institutionals, the approach, and eventually talk about the implementation to bring in the African Risk Party perspective. I think on the problem side, and I've been consistent since I've been here, while we get too technical, let's not forget about the human face of climate change. And that is the vulnerable communities that are affected by drought, by tropical cyclone, by flooding in the case of Africa, in some cases even dealing with outbreak and epidemic. And on our continent, it means food insecurity. It means vulnerable community will live below poverty line. Well, on a daily basis, if nothing is done, they actually, their life and their livelihood get affected. So the questions, having said that, what will be the answer whereby we can innovate the way we respond to actually those challenges and not obviously taking away anything about the humanitarian intervention, which we're used to in the past, whereby things may come a little bit delayed or too late, and by the time they arrive, you cannot actually save the people that we're dealing with. In our case, 35 member states, the majority of them are faced with drought issues, some tropical cyclone in Madagascar and Mozambique, and the majority also having a flood issue. So having said that, what do we need to do in Africa based on our experience to make sure that these issues are addressed in a consistent way, in a much more sustainable way, leadership first. And that's why the African Union decided about 10 years ago, in fact, we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary, how do we have an organization entirely dedicated to actually building the capacities of African countries to plan, prepare for, and respond to disasters. And as my sister from the Caribbean said earlier, if you don't plan properly, if you don't actually prepare yourself, by the time disaster happens, it may be too late to respond. And that's why those three together combine are extremely important. Now, what we see in Africa in terms of some of the challenges and the solution that we have in mind, number one, institutionals and policy coherence. In our case, in the African continent, quite often, a disaster is not managed in a consistent way whereby, in some cases, you have to deal with the Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Interior, Minister of Finance, and other ministries, and you find yourself actually uh, that inconsistency has the impact of the way you respond. Now, let me also say that some part of Africa are doing better than, than other parts of Africa. If you look at the Southern Africa, they tend to have what they call the National Disaster uh, Coordination Unit, whereby all the interventions are actually coordinated within that unit. That is not the case in West Africa. So I think the first order of business in making sure in our intervention, where necessary, we can build the capacities to those countries so whereby they have a, a single entry point so that the intervention is done in a much more coherent way. In our particular case, in each of the countries that we intervene, we have what we call a technical working group whereby the different parties can come together so our intervention is actually done in a speedy manner. So I think the institutional part need to be addressed in a way that we can be more efficient in the way we intervene. I think the second point, and this is really the issue about integration comes in. I've heard a lot about the importance of early warning system. I'm not going to make that case anymore. But the question is, how do we move from early warning system to action? In the sense there's nothing useful to any country to have access to early warning system and not take actions from that information that can help save lives. And I think to me, I see two tracks. Number one, the how do you use the early warning system to make some active policy decision that can lead to making protecting the vulnerable communities in those countries. And here I'd like to highlight a remarkable and innovative initiative at the African Union where they use actually early warning system in the flooding area and created what they call situation room. And those situation room allows the African Union to use information and bring policymakers around the table to actually decide what action needs to be undertaken so that we can actually protect the countries but also protect the lives of many countries in Africa. So I think part of the intervention, how do we make sure we strengthen the situation room in a way that Africa 
have the instrument and the platform to intervene when it comes to early warning systems all the way. I think the second part of the intervention is the response in mobilizing innovative financing so that the first response in the case of disaster is actually funded off budget so government can actually intervene. In our case, obviously we favor what we call the parametric insurance, which allows government to pull the risk of different countries and take that risk to the insurance market so that if a particular disaster triggered, you have resources that allows government to intervene in a much, much more rapid way so you can save lives. But insurance is not the only solution. There's also solidarity fund, contingency fund, social sa safety net. All this funding instrument can actually combine with insurance, increase the powerhouse of government to intervene in the way that you can save lives. Last but not least, I hear a lot about putting together a uh, loss and damage fund, putting together the global shield. There's so many initiatives being talked about here in, in COP27. My biggest concern is the capability of implementation of developing countries so that we can move actually from big ideas to implementation. And there, my recommendation is the following. There's so many existing uh, organizations in Africa, in the Caribbean, and in Latin America, they're already in the business of supporting African countries in building their capacities. So the starting point is to empower this organization in a way they can be part of the solution as opposed to being part of the problem. And our organization uh, stand ready in making sure that when those initiatives come to the level of our continent, we can leverage our existing implementation capabilities so we can speed up the implementation and begin to get to be part of the solutions. And one last thing I want to actually leave you with is the vulnerable communities. Whatever the only KPI that matters to ARC, uh, how many people we have managed to protect in what we do. In our case, since our, uh, our launch, the launch of our organization, we provided up to 125 million people, $125 million, sorry, of payout to our member states, we protected 90 million people across Africa. And that's the only KPI we look at every single day to see how much we've done to protect those people. And I think if we're able to do that, that we can demonstrate from early warning system to actions, it will help in saving lives and livelihoods. So let me stop there. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Ingrid Hoven. GRZ has implemented some innovative programs to encourage integrated planning to enable resilient development and early action. Can you share some good examples of how this has worked? What are the challenges? And what are the key elements you will recommend to policymakers for more integrated climate and disaster risk governance? Thank you, Lisa, and uh, perhaps let me start by two or three more, more general remarks before I dive deeper into specific uh, uh, programs and projects as sample. First, I would like to start by congratulating UNDRR and the WMO for really putting this subject on the agenda, comprehensive risk management, and actually the work towards early <laughs> warning systems for all. This is an extremely important, important um, agenda and it's also at the core of GIZ's um, cooperation with partner countries um, around, um, around the world. Really want to make sure that we mainstream comprehensive risk management issues so that we can make sure that our partners take the right decision in a risk-informed manner. And this becomes more important um, every day. What is one lesson learned, and this has been already alluded to by previous speakers is actually we have to work across the aisles, across and beyond silos. It's not about the one against the other. Only if we work as one community, starting from the humanitarian assistance, starting from the, the, the meteorological system, going to development and beyond, it, it really has to bring all people on board so that we can really make sure that we address the cascading risk, the multiple risk in a very comprehensive and an effective manner. Before I go, the second more general um, remark is vis-a-vis -vis early warning systems. 
because when you um, see what they can actually incentivize, and this is the early warning systems like a start in order to save lives and livelihoods and reduce damages and safeguards. And as so I came across a number and it was so striking. With an investment of around 800 million US dollars in multi-hazard early warning systems, we have just learned how the Caribbean nations address this, um, this system, we could save three to 16 billion US dollars per year. I think this is obvious. Investing in early warning system is one of the best adaptation investments we could make. It would provide one of the highest yields one, one can imagine. So this is the start I think uh, we, could, we could actually consider. Coming to specific um, project interventions. Let me bring one to your attention that deals about cross-border cooperation. As in the Caribbean, it is often so important that we not only address the national issues, but really work at the regional level. Um, in GIZ supported this type of cooperation um, with national and local institutions throughout the Drin River Basin. And this is a basin that crossed Albania, Kosovo, North Macedonia, and Montenegro. And the cooperation enabled the development of a flood hazard and risk maps. And we additionally educated and raised awareness throughout the population at the communal and local level. And it went towards the establishment of a cross-border flood early warning system. More than 30,000 people, and this is what matters most, I fully agree with Ibrahim, living close to the Drain River now receive timely early warnings. Let me give you another example from Asia. And this is about um, an insurance system that is uh, like combining early warning and insurance system based on a paramedic model that was just described for ARC in Africa. We know that in Asia, floods, typhoons, and droughts repeatedly wipe out uh, the entire harvest of many countries. And to counter this, we with our partners set up a public-private partnership to monitor rice crops. And this system is called RICE, Remote Sensing Based Information and Insurance for Crops in Emerging Economies. And this system aims to help rice farmers in governments in Southeast Asia and India to undertake timely countermeasures when faced with imminent harvest losses. More than 300 staff members from government institutions and agricultural research institutes were trained to analyze the satellite data and to create simulations that would actually inform early action. It tells them where and how much rice is being grown in the current season, how the seed is developing, and whether the fields suffer from flooding or drought conditions. And long before the harvest fails, support can be rolled out in form of replacing rice seeds and an insurance comes in against crop losses. And this type of early action, of course, is previously designed and agreed upon with the respective governmental actors and institutions, including the international community and humanitarian um, assistance institutions. Let me give you a final, very briefly, last, last example of an, of an program and a cooperation that deals with comprehensive risk management. I think it's very important that we actually spread the message across what to do, what are the minimum operational plans that are needed. And together with UNDRR and the OIRAC Research Institute, we developed a technical guidance for comprehensive risk assessment and planning, a tool that each and every institution that has to deal nowadays with disaster risk reduction can use in order to get prepared and fit for the new conditions. And this toolkit actually tries to give at hand, I mean, how to deal with the different data sets, what kind of operation issues one has to take into, into account when designing for the whole government, this is a whole of government approach that we have been developing with UNDRR in order to really implement comprehensive, effective, but also efficient uh, risk management systems. 
What we want to avoid with this guidance and how we approach this is actually that scarce governmental capacities, capacities at the municipal and local level, that they are overstretched by different agendas. So our aim is actually that we try to tackle climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction at the national, local, and sectoral planning level at the same time, not against each other, but in a very comprehensive way. And I think this is just one of the many examples of an excellent partnership between the Global Initiative for Disaster Risk Management, which has been funded by the German government and UNDRR. And this is enhancing actually the use and application of climate and disaster risk information leading to comprehensive plans. We know that we have to deal with a high level of volatility, risk are changing. We not even know nowadays when certain kipping points are reaching our people and our communities. I think the key message, and this turns to your second question, the, the most, one of the key lessons learned. First one, we have to work together. We have to reach out across silos. We shouldn't compete for scarce financing, but really figure out how we can really bring the biggest bang for the buck that is available. And this is only doable, and this is also a lesson for, and a message for development agencies at the multilateral and bilateral level that we really have to work across aisles. Unless we do so, we won't bring the type of assistance to the people that they need desperately. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. We've heard a lot of, uh, a lot of similar messages there from our different speakers. I'm hearing about being very inclusive, not only of different agencies, but also the populations themselves who are at risk, the importance of investment, Partnership clearly stood out as something that we have to do this together. Um, and the, the REAP platform also mentioned there, the, they're, they're working, they're one of the agencies that are trying to, to bring people together and facilitate that partnership towards early warning and early action. Also, the, the importance really of shifting from early warning into early action and just how complex that is sometimes for, for the agencies who are, are acting, but also the people who need to take some steps themselves. For many different reasons, it's tough to, to shift into action. And the importance of guidance also, and to, uh, guidance that can help agencies deliver all of this and um, uh, really taking into consideration the points above. We'll pause for now and take some questions from the audience for the panel. Do, please. Please say your name and your affiliation, and if it's for one of our speakers up here. <coughs> ah. I'm Laurie Gehring. I work for the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Um, I'm curious about two things. One is we're hearing this call from the UN Secretary General for total coverage with early warning within five years. I'm curious whether you think that can be done and be, not just done, but done in a way that genuinely is going to protect people. And then secondly, loss and damage has been at the front of, you know, discussions here. And, and I think it's very interesting because the line, you know, no one really knows what that is and, and what counts as avoiding that, what's adaptation, what's dealing with loss and damage, because there's a lot of crossover, as you say, the, even the silos on that are, are weak. So how do you see the, this, um, this effort with early warning, as well as things like a global shield for insurance, fitting into this picture of loss and damage here? Will that be enough to, uh, to, to satisfy the demand? Is it, is it a, a stepping stone and part of it? Where, where does that fit? Uh, thank you for the question. I'll answer, try to answer, and Ilhan might also want to come in, uh, please, um, on the, and Jagan, on the Early Warning for All initiative, which was launched in March and the action plan launched this Monday. So it's an ambitious plan, definitely, to cover the whole world. But we have to do it. Um, I think it's the question is whether we can do it or not, 
but I think it's a question of we have to do it. And we will do it with a first whole of UN system approach, WMO, IFRC, ITU, UNDRR are leads of the four pillars of an effective early warning system because as you say, it's not only about a system covering the whole world, it's about risk information, it's about forecasting and monitoring, it's about warning, distribution of warning, and it's about preparedness on the ground. And we, this all needs to come together at not only the global level, but importantly at the national level. And this is where the whole UN system, including the resident coordinators, the UN country teams on the ground have to come together. But more importantly, it also needs to be a partnership with the private sector as well, because um, it cannot be not only funded, but a lot of expertise is in the private sector, uh, including the insurance sector, which has the vast um, uh, amount of data. But it's also about working with the civil society organizations on the ground. And we now have the action plan. We will have a structured way forward that is going to be uh, a cohesive way forward. And as ambitious as it is, we need to do it because every day that we fail to do it, then every a life or more lives are lost. We know that a country that has good early warning system coverage, which is effective, had, has eight times less mortality from disasters. We also know that if early warning systems is issued, the early warning is issued 24 hours before the has disaster strikes, then there is 30% less economic loss. And as Ingrid was saying, this is a proven thing. So we need to do it. And I'm, I'm sure that with the partnership that we're going to do, we're not going to work in silos, right, Jagen? Uh, right, Johan? That we can do it. But I don't know whether uh, Jagen and um, Johan want to, um, want to come into. Maybe just to add one aspect, uh, and uh, actually, before we came to the panel, that's what exactly what we were discussing, <laughs> how challenging uh, it can be. Um, is it ambitious? Absolutely ambitious. Uh, but we have to start somewhere, isn't it? If we don't start somewhere, uh, we don't reach anywhere. I think the, uh, the only one element I want to add uh, on what Mami said is the critical critical role of the national governments and the local governments on this one. I think, of course, we can bring all the expertise internationally, uh, the knowledge internationally, the capacities internationally, but until and unless it is completely owned by the national government, and more importantly, their local governments. You know, one thing what I have seen is, in, in the early warning work, it's the local mayors, the lo you know, local village heads are the ones actually really making a real difference. So when we design the way forward, that will be extremely critical uh, that we, uh, yeah, we ensure that they lead it, actually, and we come in support and not the other way around. And that will be critical for the success. And if that happens, it is achievable. Thank you. Johan Stander, you have the important role of coming in with closing remarks, so everybody knows we haven't forgotten you. But please come in right now and respond to the question. Yeah, just a quick one. I'm not going to repeat what Mami so elegantly um, already put, did put out. Uh, just two points from our side. And my African colleague mentioned the one, and that is the capacity of the people out there to ensure that it's sustainable. There's already so many systems out there, we just don't know about it. Because let me, if I may call the world, the word, it was dumped on that particular country. And it was installed, but they don't know how to use it. They were not capacitated. And therefore, it's not sustainable. And I think the important work going forward is where our um, services commission of the WMO under the leadership of Ian Lisk will have to go out and help us find that maturity index of all our national meteorological and hydrological services 
and to connection with disaster management agencies and other, other UN partners like ITU, IFRC and others to ensure this is a success. Because once we've done that, then I'm sure that we will be able to reach the last mile. I often use the example. There's a lot of people talk about cell phone coverage and internet and all of those type of things. Those people in Africa, in the middle and the rural areas, do not have access to even electricity. What about a cell phone? They don't know what that is. And our challenge will be to get the message, the last mile, down to them. And this is what really excites me. We've got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make this work. And we've got no option then to succeed. Failure is not an option. Thank you. Mr. Shana. I wanted to add something about loss and damage and adaptation as well. Uh, the reason why we want to have more adaptation is to prevent disasters. And the reason why we want to have early warning systems is to minimize the damages because of disasters. When both fails, ad adaptation and early warning system fails, we are in loss and damage space. And it's a complex issue uh, because I think often loss and damage is described as, uh, as the immediate disaster relief. But for instance, for a country like the Maldives, we are also talking about the slow impact of climate change. Our coral reefs are dying because of the impacts of climate change. And that also has a direct impact on our fisheries sector. It has a direct impact on our tourism sector as well. So how much of that impact of climate change is affecting our national GDP? That, for, for me, is loss and damage. So it's not just about disaster relief. And often what happens is um, it's confused as these two sectors are confused. And I think loss and damage al also means continued ability of national governments to function normally and to stabilize our financial systems, to be able to stabilize our social protection systems. I'll give you an example of what happened when, um, we, when, our, when the Maldives was hit by the tsunami, for instance. There were several islands that had to be relocated completely after the tsunami. Even now, those island communities are not fully reintegrated into the host islands. And the socioeconomic problems that are arising from these island communities are ra widely range from th the kids who grew up in these temporary shelters are, are more prone to drug addiction, they're more prone to Islamic radicalization, who are now it is affecting at a national level. So this is, these questions need to be incorporated into our conversations on loss and damage. And so when we talk, ab when I talk about loss and damage, the we need a mosaic of solutions to address loss and damage, both on the rapid impacts of climate change, but also on the slow impacts of climate change. And that's why it's equally important to talk about the global goal on adaptation. When we talk about global goal and adaptation, it's becoming increasingly apparent that adaptation is not local. It's global in nature because of, because it, climate impacts are, they don't, I mean, climate change doesn't know borders. What happened in Pakistan has a direct impact on our food security as well because of supply chain disruptions and because of, what, because of the issues that are arising in, in terms of food security. Because we are a country that imports all our food from South Asian countries as well. So adaptation, loss and damage, early warning system, these are so closely linked. But my fear is that while we are having these conversations, we are, experienced, we are experiencing these directly today and we just don't have systems in place, in time, to adequately and to in an equitable manner for us to access these funds. Thank you very much. Um, I feel as if I just need to say, to be an echo here, <laughs> because um, sh my colleague from the Maldives has highlighted a number of these issues that are important to the Caribbean. 
And we will have on Monday night, uh, Monday afternoon rather at 4 p.m., uh, uh, a session on environmental monitoring and loss and damage in the Caribbean. And for us, we have some of those kinds of examples. In 2017, the Hurricane Irma hit the island of Barbuda. And for the first time in hundreds of years, all of the people had to be evacuated because coming up in line was another storm. And there was no way that those people could be protected from the next storm because everything was gone. And the manner in which land is owned in Barbuda is very different from the neighboring sister island of Antigua. It's a country of Antigua and Barbuda, but there is a difference in terms of how land ownership is considered in Barbuda. And since the, if the evacuation of the persons and then to send them back, there has been a lot of political and social effects of that one storm for the islands of Antigua and Barbuda. So there's a slow response that happens as well and the slow impact. And I also would like to reference also in the Caribbean we have transient populations, not only the tourism, which is critical to our economies, but we also have migrant workers, we have refugees, and in the case of the Bahamas, a large Haitian population some of whom could not understand the warnings that were given or they, they were just not in a place where they were getting the information and so they were woefully unprepared. And actually, it didn't matter how, how advanced you were, when a Category 5 storm sits over you for 24 hours, it's not a pretty picture. You could be the most advanced country and you could not really survive something like this. But it is even more devastating when you are dealing with a population that's already solely, so poorly um, able to deal with this kind of shock. But this continuing years after impacts is still with us. The island of Dominica, their GDP was more than 200% of their GDP was wiped out by Hurricane Maria. It developed rapidly within 24 hours into a Category 5 storm their telecommunications were broken off. Their ability to actually issue even a warning from the Met Office was not possible. And there was another storm forming. And this is why it's important to have not just national capabilities, regional and international capabilities, and systems in place ahead of time for how to get people into those islands. So f one very practical thing is if you're doing search and rescue, you have to have ways in which to allow animals to be quarantined to come into the country. So if you do not have those things ahead of time, how do you then quickly mobilize for that? When we had the volcanic eruption in St. Vincent, it was in the midst of the pandemic, 2021, we had to use the CARICOM institution, that's regional security systems. They were able to, with existing agreements and policy, move the experts at the seismic center in Trinidad and Tobago to St. Vincent and the Grenadines during the pandemic because borders were closed. So it is really important to have in place policies that are existing for when a situation arises that you need. And to remember that we're not just talking about an immediate disaster, but we're talking about socioeconomic development. Thank you. Personally, I'm really curious to hear all about how you're communicating across those populations, but that's a different panel, a different day, so we'll park that for now. Ibrahima, you've been waiting to come in. Well, I wanted to make two quick points, and one to say there is a perception that the Global Shield Policy Initiative, once we have the money, everything is solved. That's far from the truth. There are some things that need to be anticipated on, and I believe they are equally important actually funding. In the case of Africa, let me start first of all by building the culture of disastrous management and public policy. That is the only way any of this initiative can be sustainable because government have to take responsibilities and understand that governing is anticipating, managing is anticipating. When you wait till it happens, it may be too late. So I think collectively, through our advocacy, our interaction with the African government, we can begin to build that culture so the government can decide in some cases to return the risk if they, if they can afford it. 
in other cases, transfer the risk to the insurance market so they can get additional resources. And I think, to me, that is the only way we can build a sustainable way of dealing with disasters management. Otherwise, you're going to intervene whenever there is a crisis, and you're going to do it again, over and over again. It's not sustainable. That's one thing. I think second, my other concern on adaptation. We may actually get the money, but some of the countries are not fully prepared in coming up with actually a project to which you can channel the money to. So I think project preparation, in my view, is extremely important in looking at some of these countries whereby they're not ready in terms of having projects in which you can actually invest adaptation fund. So let's also think about how do we help these countries in developing a pipeline of adaptation actually opportunity for which the hundred billion dollars, once we get this money, will be actually channeled to where it's actually either bankable or that we can put the money into. I think last but not least, it is absolutely important. When we talk about early warning system, how do we build an ecosystem within the country so they can actually learn from one another? What I've seen in our 35 member states, some are quite advanced in looking at early warning system and taking actions. Some are in the early stage. I think whatever we can do to build the platform and the ecosystem so they can learn from one another, it's also a part of the solution. And I think it's important we actually foster this kind of like ecosystem whereby within Africa, Caribbean, and the Maldives, at some point, we can learn from one another so we can become part of the solutions as opposed to part of the problem. Thank you. Ingrid. Yeah, thank you. Perhaps I would like to, to add two, two points with respect to the question that was raised on adaptation and, and the Global Shield. I think it's important that we recognize that what we have seen over the last two to three years in terms of extreme weather events, damages caused, lives lost, that, that nobody has expected, I mean, when we started to negotiate the adaptation and loss and damage agenda a couple of years ago, and I have been at these conferences for quite a while. So, of course, I sincerely hope that the negotiation comes to very good results. But in between, I think it's important that we really try to roll up our sleeves and do what is doable and mobilize as much funding for the right things to do and strengthen systems and capacity really to help uh, people and countries. And um, as been said previously, I think we should not um, some are mobilized only funding for one or another initiative. What is the Global Shield? What is the, at the core? We have seen over the last couple of years that actually prearranged funding, and this can be an institution like ARC, or this can be an institution attached to the humanitarian system. But if countermeasures are in place, if protection systems are certain, are, have, are robust, if we know how to evacuate people, and know how to feed people and cattle when the worst um, happens, then actually we save a lot of not only lives, but also um, economic capacity of a country. If the money doesn't come, and we have to wait for months until we can rebuild systems, the economic losses are immense. And therefore, to think about immediately about a system that would actually extend pre-arranged funding to more countries and explicitly fill the gaps that are still there. So the departing point of the Global Shield is actually not to substitute existing institutions, to the contrary, but use them actually more, more effectively, actually capitalize them so that they can deliver their role more effectively. So what will happen is that those countries that say we would like to be part of this, there will be an analysis done to identify the protection gaps in view of the multiple risks that may actually hit a country or a sub-region. And then the Global Shield is about to identify those partners that are capable to fill those gaps. And this can be systems building, parametric insurance system like ARC, meteorological system that, that you have described. We have to consider the whole, so to say, delivery chain that is necessary really to build up a protection system. So it's not a, a new creature, so to say, but it's actually an extension of existing initiatives, so to make them working more together and make sure that really we fill the gaps. And we don't remain in silos, but really take a comprehensive country-led, 
people-centered view in order to build up a system that's really workable for those countries and can actually also absorb the additional funding that is needed that also to build up those systems. There is a price tag attached, but as we have just seen from many, many analysis, it's so much um, more effective to invent, um, invest into preparedness, preventive systems, and then in prearranged financing as well, because this actually also saves a lot of lives and life livelihoods in the medium term. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Lori. Let's have one more question, and then we'll quickly go to, to wrap up. Hello. Hi there, Alex Murray, uh, Climate Action Against Disinformation, which is a coalition of over 50 organizations working on uh, tackling climate misinformation around the world. Um, my question was going to be around, uh, you know, you're talking about communication there and communicating uh, early risks. Obviously, we know that uh, climate action is under threat from climate misinformation. I was wondering how that kind of factors into your work in terms of trying to communicate to local communities and things like that uh, when you have uh, challenges including climate misinformation. Did you, are you directing that to anyone in particular? Uh, no, I think lots of people kind of talked about communication okay. there, so perhaps someone. Does anyone want to take that? Shall I? Okay. Ask <laughs> The question of misinformation is one that the National Meteorological Services have to deal with now. It is a reality that whenever the smallest cloud appears off the coast of Africa, someone somewhere makes it into a Category 5 storm. And it is a, it is this very serious problem, actually, for the meteorological services to be the authoritative voices for warnings in their nation. And this is one of the reasons why we've been pushing for legislation to be put in place so that actually there is a penalty to be applied for persons who without authority would be issuing warnings. And we just, as I mentioned earlier, with the help of the WMO, instituted model legislation and we've been drafting national versions of those over the last year. And in working with the ministries, and the legal um, affairs officers of those ministries, we've had them say, we need to assign a fine to persons who actually proliferate misinformation. And in one case, the legal consultant mentioned a figure and the, the, the local official said, no, 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 we need to double that because this is very serious business that could lead to loss of life. And we, our um, media authorities and media officials, we're looking to them for assistance, for how to communicate better in smaller bits. We call them sort of bite-size information that's already prepared to meet some of the common things that come out every time there's a storm. There are usually a bunch of clouds that have nothing to do with the Caribbean that are sent out by everyone saying, this is the picture from the current storm. Um, we also do have, though, this idea of persons who will automatically be sending out things that are really, really wrong and can put people's lives at, 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 um, in, in, in jeopardy. So we are looking to the media in particular, and we've been working with the Caribbean Broadcasting Union, and the UNDRR in the Caribbean has a project called Media Saving Lives, and myself and the head of Sedima have started that dialogue with the Caribbean Broadcasting Union to help us to really be better communicators in response to this misinformation. Thank you. Can we had one, we had Can I just add up? to that comment? Really, really sorry. So Ian List, President of the Services Commission at the WMO. Um, just to add to that comment, one of the roles that the WMO will have, it is a standard setting organization. So actually generating the standards and recommended practices about 
what is the standards for issuing warnings and all the rest of it, will be a component part of what we do over the next five years. I just wanted to add that in as well, which will give us a bit of a stick when this type of thing happens. Thank you. Sorry for taking the floor. All right. Thank you. Woman right here with a... Thank yes. You. No white. Thank, Thank you. you. So, oh, sorry. I want to reflect the, the, regarding the, um, uh, the, the gap to close uh, uh, for early warning systems. Um, I see different challenges, one relating to capacity building, the other one to data, not only climate data, but also socio-economical data, especially for risk assessment and also um, governance, particularly in Africa, governance between among different stakeholders, including the mass services, the disaster management services, but also uh, other sectors at stake or, or, or the communities or local authorities. I would like to ask to Arlen perhaps how they uh, uh, went through these challenges, if you can have lessons learned, if you want to implement early warning systems in Africa. That was directed to you. I, I wanted to repeat what you, you were asking about closing the gaps in terms of social economic data. That is actually one of the challenges that we have within the Caribbean. We have systems for integrating a lot of information. At the Institute, at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology and at SEDEMA, they do have these systems where you can integrate a lot of information that's geolocated, but the we are having gaps because some of the countries have not yet actually done the analysis to determine their risks for vulnerability for different populations, not mapped, for example, where are the disabled, where are the elderly, where, you know, where are the migrant populations who may speak a different language. All that information is, some of it's not yet in that system, but the framework is there for integrating it when it is available, and we are we are hoping that as part of this effort, we will get some support that would enable us to build up that part of the data system, of the database. Because we just recently completed a gender mainstreaming for flood forecasting and to end warning systems in Antigua and Barbuda in September. And we included a number of gender bureaus and um, and gender bureaus doesn't just mean women and children, but it included uh, vulnerable populations like the disabled. And there was a lot of discussion in terms of how do we work with communities that, uh, and community leaders who represent those populations. So coming out of that workshop, there are a number of recommendations that I believe the WMO will be having to share with UNDRR and others because you now have the center of excellence um, with the WMO and the UNDRR. And I think more efforts like those, that gender mainstreaming workshop where we sat together with gender bureaus, had discussions about community level action and community mapping on how to include the youth, for example. There was a lot of discussion and examples from islands of how to include the youth in gathering the data that allows you to determine that level of risk for those populations. And because, of course, they're living in the world that will be in most danger as more and more climate effects manifest themselves, then it is really important to entrain the youth into this kind of activity. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Ibrahima wants to come in, we'll keep it brief, and then I we'll get to closing. I think you brought up one that is extremely important as far as Africa is concerned. If we want to make early warning system technology and system available to African countries. One of the biggest challenges we have at ARC is the following. We are using third party data, in this case NOAA, in actually modeling drought, flood, and tropical cyclone. Anytime there's a data error, an effect our underwriting, an effect our reinsurance, and eventually it puts some credibility issues out with the countries and actually challenging our model. So our business model is actually under threat unless we address the reliability of data. So I think in the discussion, 
we should think about what I call innovation lab, innovation hub, where we can actually combine organizations that have this capability of bringing data in a way that our model is reliable. And that's why just yesterday, we signed an MOU with IBM because they have the ability on climate research and climate data so that our model is that reliable. So I think in the early warning system, as far as developing countries are concerned, the issue of data remains a major challenge. So whatever we can do to address them, it will go a long way in providing credibility to our modeling and eventually to the response we can provide. Thank you. For the sake of time, we'll, we'll end questions there. I hope the panel agrees that it was important to, we'll condense our closing reflections. It was important to hear from the rest of the audience. So in 30 seconds or less, can you just share a reflection or a recommendation even for the future? And then when we finish, we'll then hear from Johan, the closing remarks. So a lot of challenges and a lot of common challenges have been presented, but also very encouraging work on the ground happening as well. So I feel both daunted by this big project that we have in front of us, but also encouraged. I think uh, we heard a lot of good examples. I think what we need to do now is take those good examples to scale, because they are small, they are fragmented. So I think that's probably the, the, the main thing we have to do now. And maybe the couple of concrete things we could follow up is one is what I heard from a number of uh, colleagues here is the, the regulatory framework seems to be critical to take this forward in the countries to make it happen. So I think in all the countries, I know we ourselves have supported around 42 countries to develop the regulatory framework. We do have that expertise, and I know many others have that expertise. I think having the proper regulatory framework everywhere, I think that's, that I see as a concrete first step we can take. And I think the second thing I still believe very, very, very strongly is that having the local government, the local community organizations at the forefront of this initiative would be critical for this success, including the, the misinformation management. Huh? Uh, I know we can set the standards and things like that, but the standards will go only a certain step. The, the trusted information comes from the local leaders, the community leaders. That's what they trust. So the focus has to be at that level as we saw that in the, uh, during the COVID-19. People would not trust me, but people trust the local, local leader. And that's what we need to put the focus. I think one of the things that I was um, thinking about when I was listening to the panelists was how important it is to understand the tipping points um, that will help us better in planning um, for resilience, and these are really important for us um, to reduce the impacts of any disasters. And um, it, it was very enlightening to hear what you have to say about what the Caribbean is doing, and I think regional cooperation and, um, is really important in terms of um, strengthening regional cooperation is really important in these kind of um, situations as well. I mean, I, I wrote down many things, strengthening local governance, insurance schemes, remote sensing, um, equal, accessible, and predictable finance is really important as well. So I'll leave it there. I think one of the most important to achieve something in such a short time is understanding and strengthening the existing systems. We cannot build from scratch in five years. And so the institutions that are successful and know their territories and know the local context, I think emphasis should be given in terms of strengthening those institutions and strengthening the community level as was spoken earlier here, because that last mile, that last person needs to understand what action has to be taken and take that action. And that only comes about when you're working with persons who know that local context. So just to say strengthen the persons who understand already the local context. Thank you. Now that's four, four points uh, for, for, to finish this. Um, then I would first like to reiterate that we really have to work across silos um, and, and 
work against tendency to fall back into our own ecosystems. We need really to, um, to be very determined in, in, in forming strong partnership and alliances built on trust, built on fairness, and built on solidarity. We not only need a whole of government approach, but a whole of society approach. That is also dealing with gender issues and, and those that are being left behind. And finally, one also has to think about those countries that are fragile right now. And not only fragile because climate has such a huge impact already, but uh, due to perhaps internal conflicts. And there, of course, it will be even more difficult to achieve um, the Sendai targets. And we also have to uh, somehow to factor this into the equation and make sure that the type of programs and support systems that we try to deliver, that they are also dealing with peace issues and fragile issues at the same time. Thank you. Well, I have a hundred point to make, now only three. And it's called implementation and implementation and implementation. I think implementation in making sure that any early warning system we come up with, they're accessible to the countries where they are needed. Implementation in terms of making sure whatever funding that we actually put on the table, they're accessible to where it's needed. Implementation in making sure we build the capacity of existing organizations so we're not reinventing the wheel, we're empowering them. And implementation in making sure whatever we do, the end result is resilience. So we can protect people. If we do that, when we meet at COP28, we got a great story to tell. Thank you. Johan, please, closing remarks. Thank you. So instead of reading a lot of information in front of me, I thought of giving just a couple of nuggets which, which I picked up today. Um, as a lot of information that's on this paper was already shared, <laughs> and that's brilliant. However, I would like to just comment to one small thing. And it, it, I think it sort of summarizes the three questions that came from the panel. And that is about the authoritative voice of the National Meteorological and the Hydrological Services and to ensure that this is communicated down to the community and those in the communities. With this, and as we're working with UNDRR in the center of excellence, we've, we can only succeed, because we know 80% of the disasters out there are, natural, are weather related, or let me call it um, hydrometeorological related. But what about the other 20%? We've got to bring in those hazards. We've got to bring in those warnings to ensure we've got a full multi-hazard early warning system. And when we talk about the full multi-hazard early warning system, the initial funding of three million, which all the heads of state said, well done, will support when, uh, when the United Nations Secretary General with the WMO um, launched it the other day. Yes, it was uh, supported by the heads of states and the ministers and heads of agencies, the private sector, and then also the funding agencies. But this 3.1 billion we initially required to start is nothing compared to what we will save on the return of investment of already 24 billion, at least in the five years. Then we're almost halfway there of the 50 billion required for the adaptation fund. And the, and the comment of the United Nations Secretary General saying this must be a cup of action is one of the examples of this is true action and together we can do it. And when we look at the four pillars of the multi-hazard early warning system, I think it summarizes all the main points that the panel has raised today. It came out to protect all, communication, partnership, collaboration, data sharing, policy, system to action, empowering the countries, work together, or like some people may call it, the togetherness in this process going forward. Why, at the end of the day, to save lives? And everybody, when they highlighted these points, 
can see themselves as part of the multi-hazard early warning system framework. And with this, colleagues, I would like to, to get the unified effort we can deliver on the UNSG score that everybody on Earth is protected by early warning systems within five years. Together, we will deliver on the aspirations of the Paris Agreement, the Sendai Framework, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and achieve a resilient and just world for all. With that, I thank you. All right, thank you everyone. If we were broadcasting, we would have been off air six minutes ago, so thank you for, for staying still. It's a fantastic panel. You've kept everybody here seated in your places. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.